Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. This is the webinar for CIS TNI, uh, that's CNS 205 TNI. Tonight we're going to be covering CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-801, and the objectives tonight are 1.3 and 1.4. So way back at the beginning. And what are those? <coughs> Excuse me. Tonight we're going to be talking about RAM, and then we're going to talk about expansion cards. So let's go ahead and jump into RAM. So the first one we're going to talk about, this is one that you don't need to know about, but I like to talk about it anyways, and that's SIM. Uh, single inline memory modules. It's actually kind of what kick-started the modern computing era. It was introduced by Wang Laboratories in 1983. Uh, where is it located now? Guess what? It's a dead technology. It's not really located anywhere. What was the main advantage of SIMS? Well, they were a whole lot easier to work with than DIPDRAM. If for those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, DIP DRAM, DIP stands for Dual Inline Package. They were actually uh, chips uh, instead of sticks, and they popped right into your motherboard in the sockets. They looked, when you pulled them out, people liked to, used to make uh, bug art with them when they were dead. It seems are uh, where things really kind of got kick-started in the modern computing era. era. SIMS led to DIMMs. Uh, actually, SIMS led to SD-RAM, because let's go ahead and go there. Uh, SD-RAM is Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory. Uh, they synchronized the RAM with the system clock, and they could perform an operation with every cycle of the clock. Now the clock has a tick up and a tick down. That is one cycle. So originally, if you had a 33 megahertz clock cycle, your SD RAM ran at 33 megahertz. Now, conceptually, SD RAM was uh, birthed in the 1970s but it didn't hit the industry until 1993. Where do you find it? Uh, on the motherboards. One of the things that I'll tell you though is if you're still using just plain old SD RAM, uh, you might want to consider an upgrade. It was technically slower than EDO gram, uh, but its ability to in effect multitask actually increased the memory bandwidth, so it was actually more efficient than its faster cousin. From SD-RAM, from SIM SD-RAM, we moved into DIMMs, dual inline memory modules. Now, uh, DIMMs were an improvement over SIMs. The main difference was is when you looked at the, the electrical connectors on a SIM. It had electrical connectors on both sides, but only one side was being used. With the advent of DIMMs, uh, they actually used both sides of the electrical contact. All current memory is a type of, <coughs> excuse me, or a type of DIMM. They're in the DIMM family. Uh, one of the things that DIMMs also introduced was the 64 data bit bus for RAM. And what that really did is in Pentium, the early Pentium PCs, they required that their the memory modules be installed in pairs because they required a 64 bit bus for the memory. With the advent of DIMMs, you didn't have to put in matched pairs anymore. You could go back to putting in singles. So from the standard DIMM is where we got DDR. 
DDR is double data rate SDRAM. Uh, it effectively doubled the data rate, data transfer rate, by taking advantage of the rising and falling edge of the clock cycle. What that means is, is you could perform an operation on the uptick and you could perform an operation on the downtick. Now DDR uh, was introduced in 1996 and it was mainly found on motherboards and graphic cards. Uh, it was a vast improvement over the standard DIMM and it had a max transfer rate of 1,600 megabytes a second. It came in varying pin counts, and that was the electrical connectors along the bottom of the edge. From DDR, we moved to DDR2. Guess what? Second generation. It was introduced in 2003. Again, you found, found it on motherboards and graphic cards. Um, the thing about DDR2 is you can operate at 400 megahertz cycles or higher. Uh, the max transfer rate on a 100 megahertz clock cycle is 3,200 megabytes a second. And another advantage of DDR2 over straight DDR was the fact that it was more energy efficient. Then we jump into DDR3, uh, third generation. It was introduced in 2007, and it has a max, um, actually, yeah, there we go. It has a max transfer rate of 6,400 megabytes a second on a 100 megahertz clock cycle. It also allowed for larger um, sizes of, of memory modules, larger sticks. That's uh, when you started to see larger capacity RAM. Uh, the new standard is DDR4. I don't have the stats on that because that's not really relevant to the exam, uh, but you might want to keep your eyes out in case things change. Uh, so I'm going to back up a moment. DDR, DDR was twice as fast as the standard DIMM. DDR2 was twice as fast as DDR. DDR3 is twice as fast as DDR2. So if you notice, it's an exponential curve. Uh, so you can kind of expect the same stats to hold true for DDR4. Now we need to back up a little bit. We're going to talk about RAM bus. There was a lot. There was a lot of high hopes for RAM bus when it came out. It was de developed in the mid 1990s, and it was supposed to replace the standard DIM. Uh, part of the high hopes for RAM bus came from the fact that um, Intel licensed their technology. They were going to make it so all Intel chips had to use RAM bus memory. What really kind of scotched it is AMD, who was the other big player, and Cyrix. Uh, they didn't go that route. They, they did have some chipsets that required RAM bus, but the majority of their chipsets didn't, and they were cheaper, and the consumer market went with the more cost effective. Uh, RAM bus is proprietary. And the thing about RAM bus is you have two ways to install it. You can either put it in in matched pairs, or you can put in a single stick of RAM bus, but in the other slot, you need a continuity module to close the circuit. Uh, RAM bus is also often called a RIM. By the way, just in case you wanted to know, RAM bus as a company is still around. But what they're known for now is being a patent troll. So also really doing their, their inexistent, inexistence to file lawsuits. What a way for a company to go. 
So now let's talk about sodium. Uh, small outline dual inline memory module. This is RAM for laptops, uh, sometimes tablets. Uh, you will find some sodiums in high-end routers and high-end printers. That's compact. It also came in DDR, DDR2, and DDR3 uh, capacities. I don't think DDR4 is available in sodium yet. I haven't looked, but there it is. Um, Yeah, people get confused a lot of the times when you're when you go in and you ask for a stick of RAM if you're in an, an uninformed facility. Uh, they will actually bring out sodium when you wanted a standard standard size. I just actually went through that the other night. It was kind of embarrassing, not for me. So now let's talk about the comparison of the different types of RAM. And the first thing we need to talk about is parity versus non-parity. Uh, your standard PC does not require parity RAM, which is a good thing because purchasing uh, parity type RAM, the EEC RAM, it's kind of expensive. Uh, it can be a little bit beneficial. It will find errors in memory and let you know. The problem is, is it doesn't fix the error. It only lets you know that the error is there. Some server setups still require that its RAM be of the parity type. So you need to read the documentation, particularly when you're installing RAM into a server to make sure that it, it's not required. So now let's talk about single-sided versus double-sided RAM. A lot of people think that it means the memory modules that are either on one side or on both sides of the RAM. That's not really what it means. What it means is that your RAM that's on the stick is actually separated into ranks. Uh, you'll have a rank one, rank two, rank three. Actually, you can have up to a quad rank. Uh, only one rank of RAM can be accessed at a time. It's a little bit slower than single-sided because it needs to switch between the ranks, but it's also a little bit less expensive. Uh, single-sided RAM doesn't have ranks. Well, actually it does, but it only has one rank of RAM. And it's a whole lot faster than double-sided RAM, but it has a corresponding price increase. But the thing to remember is that it doesn't really have to do with the memory modules being on both sides of the stick or on the single side. It has to deal with how the memory modules are actually configured. So now let's talk about RAM configuration into a PC. A lot of PCs are single channel. That means that it doesn't matter where in the in the DIMM slots you put your RAM, each one's going to have a 64-bit lane of communication to the CPU. Then there's dual channel. That's a whole lot more common now. Um, dual channel gives you 128 bits of communication between the RAM and the CPU. But that also means that you need to put in two sticks of RAM, and they are particular into which slots they go into. You need to read the, the motherboard documentation. And then there's triple channel. Uh, added another 64 bits worth of capacity to give you a grand total of 192-bit lanes, 192-bit lane of communication between the RAM and the CPU. Uh, again, they're kind of particular into which slots they go. Some some have you put them all on in sequential, some are every other, so on and so forth. Read the motherboard documentation. If you're using uh, dual channel or triple channel and you don't fill the proper number of slots, well, the end result is your RAM still works, 
but it chokes you back down to a 64-bit uh, line of communication. So if you're going to put in multiple modules, you're better off putting them in the right slots. So now we're going to talk about compatibility and speed. Um, RAM modules do not interchange. Each type of RAM has a key slot on the bottom, and it matches a key area on the DIMM slot. That way you cannot put DDR RAM into a DDR2 DIMM slot. It just it won't work. Well, you could, but you'd need to actually create a new notch in your RAM to do it which I think might actually ruin the RAM. Um, you can mix and match different speeds of RAM. The one caveat to that is, is when you do that, you will only run at the, your max speed will be the speed of the slowest module. That's something to keep in mind. Um, For most people, that's not that big of a deal, but if you're a gamer or uh, somebody else who needs high performance out of your PCs, I don't recommend mixing and matching. Well, actually, I do. Uh, just make sure that your, your slowest RAM meets your minimum requirements. Now let's actually talk about the speeds. Um, as I've stated on this slide, not all RAM is created equal. Some RAM is faster than others. Uh, and as a rule, the faster the RAM is, the more expensive it is. Kind of like the lower, it, the lower its latency is, the more expensive it is. Uh, performance costs money. Uh, speed of RAM is measured in megabytes per second, not megabits, but megabytes. And as a general rule, the speed is not plainly listed on the packaging. They use a naming convention, and I've got it over here off to the side. You can actually determine the speed by using the, the following formula. It's the clock speed, so if you are running a 100 megahertz clock, it's 100 megahertz, times your clock multiplier, which you will find in BIOS, uh, times the double pumping, times the lane width, divided by 8. So if you're running a triple channel uh, RAM, your lane width is 192 bits, so on and so forth. So you can figure this all out for your own. Um, And I think they might ask a question or two about speed on the test, but they're pretty easy to figure out. So now let's move on to expansion cards. And before I get too deep into this, I'm going to say this is going to be really quick and really basic because really that's all you really need to know is what kind of expansion cards there are. Uh, but before we do that, here's the question, which comes first? Do you install the device or do you dis the device or expansion card first or do you dis install the driver? It all depends upon the manufacturer. Uh, some manufacturers don't care. You can put the device in or the card in and then the driver. Uh, but other manufacturers have discovered problems, uh, particularly with Microsoft. Or micro, if you do that, Microsoft will use the incorrect driver and then make it really difficult to put in the correct driver or to use the correct driver. So they actually will require you, require you to install the driver first. In those cases, the documentation usually says it in big, bold letters install driver first, and in which case I do recommend that you do that because it will save you time, effort, and headaches. Okay, so the, the steps to install an expansion card. 
So first thing is first, read the instruction for the device. And then follow proper safety procedures. Power down the computer. Unplug the computer from the wall socket. Actually, I usually unplug it from the power supply. Um, open the case. Insert the card into the appropriate spot. Plug in any internal cabling as required. Plug in any, in, any internal power as required. That's particularly for video cards. Uh, close the case. Plug in and power up the PC. Update drivers as necessary. And voila, you've now installed your own. Uh oh. We have somebody who's trying to get into the webinar, and they can't get in. Uh-oh. So now let's talk about different kinds of expansion cards. There are sound cards. Older sound cards have a musical instrument digital interface, MIDI interfaces. Those of you who are used to older joysticks know that your joystick plugged into the MIDI interface. Most sound cards use what's called a tip ring sleeve connector, a TRS connector. We're used to seeing those because those are the things that our headphones plug into. And they actually have three connection points at the tip, at the ring, and at the sleeve. Imagine that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other more expansion cards. We have video cards, AGP or PCIe connections. Uh, the PCIe usually require more power, especially nowadays, unless you're going with a budget video card. And by the way, if you can still buy a motherboard with an AGP slot, I want to know where you found it, especially if it's new, because that's getting a little bit old. Uh, network cards. Not as common now. It used to be every time you bought a PC, you also, if you were lucky, you had an internal modem. But if you wanted to connect to an inter, to a network, excuse me, using an Ethernet cable, a CAT cable, you had to install a network card. Um, new computers nowadays do not come, as a general rule, with serial or parallel ports. Um, if you're working in retail, a lot of those point of sale systems require a serial or a parallel port, uh, particularly for their scanners and or uh, dongles, for those of you who know what a dongle is, which means that you've got to buy it, an add-on card to add that capacity to your PC nowadays. And it's actually kind of a pain in the butt. USB cards. You can put in an adapter, a, a USB card, into a PCIe slot and increase your USB capabilities. Same with FireWire. One of the things that's also occurring now, especially with is the newer standards of PCIe, is you're getting um, solid state hard drives that actually plug into your PCIe slot instead of your SATA slot. Uh, you can get some performance performance advantages. Um, another thing that you can do is you can plug in a RAID card, a hardware RAID. It is usually much faster uh, more efficient and more robust than software RAID. And if you still want to use that technology, you can do the SCSI card, the Small Computer Serial Interface. SCSI was big for a while. You don't see it quite so much, but it's not dead yet. Uh, it just happens to have moved uh, onto the network. It's now called iSCSI. And it's more, uh, trying to think of how I would say this, conceptual in nature, uh, protocol in nature, there we go, than actual hardware the way it used to be. Uh, we do have to mention modem cards. 
believe it or not, some people still need modems, uh, dial-in modems. Some companies require their people, instead of using a, a VPN tunnel over the Internet, to direct dial in on their VPNs, in which case a lot of people need to install a dial-up modem into their PC. It's becoming a little bit more rare, but then again, you need to be aware that you may come across that situation. Uh, you can add wireless and cellular cards, particularly if you don't want to use a USB dongle. So you can actually add that capability inside of your case. The next two are closely related. And that's the TV tuner card, which allows you to watch and record television from your PC. It usually includes a jack on the back of it so that you can plug in your coaxial cable from your cable provider. Um, and it is closely related to the video capture card. As a matter of fact, a lot of TV tuner cards actually have video capture capabilities. Uh, but some video capture cards are specific to um, sources. Um, I've seen some that were uh, proprietary. I haven't seen one like that in a while, but you, you might come across it if you have a piece of video equipment where you want to download the, the content you need to be aware that it might require a special card. Uh, riser cards. This is more of a discussion of a funky slot. Uh, it's a multi-purpose slot inside of a PC. They're not as common as they used to be. Actually, they went through a phase where they were highly common. They went for, through a phase where they weren't quite as common. And now they're becoming more common again with the smaller form factor PCs. The riser card actually sat at a right angle most of the time to your normal slots. And it allowed you to put in a low profile card. Most often uh, that was a network card, at least it was in the past. Sometimes they were modems, but since it was a multi-purpose slot, it was whatever the manufacturer made to fit in that riser card slot. And I know I cruised through that really fast. Um, thank you for attending this, uh, this webinar.